Hey guys, this is Pilot Graham Ricks. This is our long lost pilot episode that Ian and I recorded together quite a while ago. It was our episode that we were trying to use to figure everything out and get the organization down and just try to get our speaking down and everything to help us out with this podcast. And we figured since the sequel will mark our return on the fall season, we should go ahead and release this one so you guys can get an idea kind of how the podcast started. And this first episode has no audio equipment. We actually recorded this on Ian's iPhone in his apartment. So I just want to apologize for the sound quality. And I hope you guys enjoy it. And thanks for listening. So here it is, our bonus episode, The Maze Runner. Welcome to the Half Pass Podcast. This is Season 1, Episode 0, The Pilot. And I'm Graham Ricks, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, or what I like to call co-pilot, Ian Jones. I love that freaking intro music. Yes, I am so glad that we have that intro music. I, it, just, it gets me ready to record. It gets me ready for something else. So today we're going to talk about the movie The Maze Runner. Directed by Wes Ball, based on a novel by James Dashner. Did you read that thing? What? Did you, the novel? No, I, no, I, didn't, yeah, no, I didn't. I did not read. Well, I read it if there's a movie. Although it is interesting with those movies that when you watch the previews for them, they always, you can just tell it started from a book first. I don't know what that is, but it just has this look and feel to it. I guess it's because it's always post-apocalyptic. And then they usually tell you to. That's usually how I know. But it's based on a award-winning novel. This is a spoiler cast that we will review and rate movies weekly. We record them right after we watch the movie. And the idea is that you will listen to this to and from the movie theater. So it'll be like you're listening into a conversation on the car ride home when we review the movie. So let's go ahead and get into the review. When Thomas wakes up trapped in a massive maze with a group of other boys, he has no memory of the outside world other than strange dreams about a mysterious organization as wicked. Only by piecing together fragments of his past with clues he discovers in the maze. Can Thomas hope to uncover his true purpose and a way to escape? Some of the quirks I have about this movie is the community chamber. When they're when the Gravers finally get in there towards the end and they open up all four sides. They're sat at night and the Gravers come through. The scene right before this one is actually the Griever is completely destroys one of the wooden huts that they have built up and then yeah. in the next scene all of a sudden the griever can't get into the community chamber which apparently was built with with gusto <laughs> with, with adamantium <laughs> steel so the community chamber you know that's the chamber that all these boys are sent up in one at a time along with su supplies once every month and it doesn't even look like it's that well built it uh, looks like it barely survives the trip up the damn tunnel. And it's also right in the middle. It isn't that deep. And yet it's the safest place to be once the Grievers find their way in. And the Griever is actually climbing on top of it and shoots his little scorpion tail through to remove a single pole that apparently is supporting the entire structure. Which doesn't make any sense to me. The other thing is I always thought that and the scene where they finally get Teresa up, and she's up in that tower just launching stuff with, at everybody, which is actually just a real kind of funny scene. Really nice about this movie. It happens often and throughout the movie where there's a lot of little nice, fun little scenes in there. But you think they could just wait her out. Like, she wouldn't have everything, right? There can't be... <laughs> 
<laughs> right. So you kind of lose sight of the fact that these these guys are kids. They all do a really damn good job, and and you know they're they're definitely afraid, but they're sort of strong together. And when she shows up, that's sort of the first time you see them acting like kids. It's like, oh yeah, these these are kids. They aren't twenty year olds. Hopefully. Well, well, some of the actors I'm are, sure are. Four years old. <laughs> what, what I was glad about was, you know, the girl comes in, she doesn't even come in, I think, until after the halfway point. She's like the end of Act 2. And I'm so glad none of them got rapey <laughs> when <laughs> she came in. Like, it wasn't one of those movies. One of those really weird things. <clears throat> I actually, my, one of the things I enjoyed that they did with her that happens a lot in these movies is it instantly turns into, like, a love story. And oh, yeah. They yeah. introduce this female character. She obviously knows Thomas. And they go through the process of trying to get her to understand what's going on. But it almost seems like a lot of times in these movies they put a character in there just as a love interest and she definitely wasn't that and there wasn't a love triangle either they they really avoided two tropes you know she came in here and <laughs> immediately just from the look of her i thought she might have been what's that twilight girl's name kirsten stewart yeah i thought she might have been her stunt double or something it's... like they couldn't get her so they found this other actress <laughs> it's a crime in this movie that a lot of the promotional posters and materials with her in it she looks a lot like kirsten stewart which is a crime for this movie because it's just better than those other ones it is it is better and i was afraid it was going to be just like that, or the Hunger Games, where it was just freaking awful to watch. I don't care how big, how many fans they have. Those are definitely girl movies, and this just really wasn't that. It it looked like it could have been, but it really avoided a lot of the typical teenage stuff you see in these kind of movies. Which I also thought they did a very good job in the casting aspect of the movie. I thought the acting was actually really solid throughout there was never a time period where i cringed at lines yeah with younger actors i mean the whole thing was younger actors there wasn't a single scene i think with a younger actor and a grown-up maybe at the the very end the only one i recognized was uh thomas brody sangster the guy who played newt from, yeah game from, of thrones. from game of thrones right, yeah I like it we gave a throw. Has everybody watched that one? Right. <laughs> if you haven't already, I won't spoil anything. But he was the only one that I recognized. A lot of these other guys I just had never seen in shows or movies before. It seems like a lot of them definitely had other jobs from just a lot of teen drama stuff. Like uh, Dylan O'Brien, the main character, played Thomas. He was in MTV's Teen Wolf, which I have not seen i don't know why i would have seen but <laughs> that's right. what, there's that uh will poulter who played galley which by the way very awesome villain type character throughout yeah <laughs> he's definitely you know, an anti they they did i thought they did a really good job with him because he he's kind of justified in everything he's saying and you almost want to to kind of root for him and and have him see things the same way as the protagonist without him just being totally over the top I, I think he's really justified in his actions which which i thought was a nice balance it definitely was a nice balance in the in that character and i like that they gave him at the end of the movie that he actually got a shot of him looking towards them leaving essentially after he was already kind of gone and you could tell that they were trying to get you to identify with them in some way or another. And I thought that was just real nice. I love when they do that for, for villains. Prime example is Man of Steel, where he's just, uh, what's his name? Mike Shannon, General Zod. General Zod. Yeah. You definitely understand his his reasonings for doing what he has to do for the good of his people, which is the same type of yes. villain or portrayal of that character i think my favorite character was um probably the uh asian dude minko minho minho yeah 
Never a bad hair day in this weird post-apocalyptic world. Everyone looks like crap, like garbage. And he has perfect hair, and it doesn't matter what the hell's going on. So, I don't know if they're setting up mirrors and hair products. He's definitely hoarding all of it. He was ready. He was ready for some girls to show up, I think. (laughs) Because he looks like he could have gone right from that to, like, the sequel to Tokyo Drift (laughs) that no one asked for. (laughs) Like, I'm ready. Let's do this. I definitely enjoyed Minho as a character also. He just had a lot of a lot of heroic moments and a lot of cowardly moments, but he always, he just was always useful and he's always there. Which in a lot of these movies this happens all the time where you'll have a group of kids or a group of people where people are absolutely useless. This movie doesn't do that. And I think that that's a really positive point to this movie is that all these background characters show up at one time or another to show their usefulness to move the story along. Even just the scene where Thomas kills the griever and they all decide to go back to pick up the transmitter. And when Minho came back and asked, well, is this enough? And it had all those people. I like that it was guys that he had introduced earlier or were introduced earlier during the fire scene where he's like, these are the slicers and so on and so forth. And the guy that was the slicer was there. And he was there because he was one of the slicers. And just in case they needed somebody with skilled hands to to dissect something, they had him there to get the transmitter out. So I thought that was absolutely fantastic part of the movie. Just everybody saw their usefulness, even towards the end of the movie, where the one kid who was their medicine man character, that black kid, who basically sacrifices himself to save Min Ho so that he can tell them the sequence of numbers in order to open the gate. And one black guy did make it at the end, so that's <laughs> so positive. I think we're all a little sick of just seeing that always happen. That's definitely a movie trope that's very interesting. Most of what we're talking about is stuff that we liked. Before we get into like some dislikes, you know, I know you had you had mentioned the pacing, and I think that was sort of something I liked too. It it kind of reminded me of the first time I watched Predator. Now they're totally different movies, but I like sort of the peeling back of the layers. You see what the problem is, but you just sort of get glimpses of it, mm-hmm. and and it's really rewarding once I think they get into the maze. And start having to deal with those creepers. They're quite terrifying. I definitely like the uh, concept of the creepers. I thought the fact that they were half organic, half mechanic doesn't quite make sense. But the animation of them fit that very well. And that's one of the things that I always look at with different creatures. Or, and the animation was fantastic on that. And I thought they did a very good job of making it really creepy. Yeah, there's... <laughs> Definitely no shortage of uh, creepiness. And and that's the thing. You know, the other thing, too, which is something no one actually says anything about, but there's sort of this awkwardness, which is always in every scene, and that is because that wall is so high in the back that it kind of just blocks out the sky and there's just something about it that gives you a little bit of an uneasy feeling almost like if you're standing there that you would get the sense of scale yeah you you just don't you don't normally see that well there's no sky there's like getting trapped under a canopy of trees where everything looks the same yeah that's definitely something that i didn't really think of and that that's actually a really good point i uh all the shots are like that and they're all just because of that, it definitely does make it uneasy. Point I didn't even realize that when watching it. I have I did notice that some of the shots that I really enjoyed were there's a lot of scenes with the main character Thomas. There's shots of him laying down, and he's interacting with another actor. And there's something very interesting about those shots because it's a downward angle shot at your hero, essentially. Which 
gives you a sense that he's not quite there yet. And mm-hmm. I noticed that they actually did that a lot in this movie, where he's just he's just not quite there yet. And so a lot of these shots are these downward shots of him laying down, which typically doesn't happen with a hero. The hero is always these upward shots. It gives you this sense that he's larger than life. But in this movie, most of the time when they shoot him, he's he's it's always this downward shot to, to make him really human-like as opposed to just the over-the-top hero that comes in and saves the day, which I thought was really, really nice. And I think that's just a credit to uh, Wes, what, Wes Ball the the director and how he did his shots and i just i just loved that aspect of it he definitely has a knowledge even though this was his first movie he definitely knows how to create the story and tell the story through his shots and through his direction so i think some things that kind of bugged us about it one of the things which is sort of nitpicky for me was this whole thing wicked is good and uh you know, this might lead a little bit into the ending of the movie. The acronym of this disembodied organization, Wicked, is WCKD. And acronyms really annoy me in movies. But it it especially annoys me because there are no vowels in this one. <laughs> at, least in the, at least in the second Ninja Turtles, there is PGRI. Uh, <laughs> that isn't even the worst part of that movie but I don't know there's just something about it and that may have something to do with the book or you know but they never really explain the, the whole wicked is good thing which it is annoying to me that that would well, keep coming up and the other thing that annoys me is that it stands for world catastrophe kill zone department which just seems very clunky. Very, very clunky. <laughs> you know, oh, well, that's a bad on me because I didn't even get that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think by that point in time, I just was, I think, wondering, well, what the hell is going on next? Because, you know, the whole movie is sort of leading up to this point where they're now on the outskirts of the facility. They're in the lab, but... It isn't really the explanation I guess I was hoping for. And I, I particularly didn't find that part satisfying at all because it just seemed like it was, well, we're going to do a sequel out of this come hell or high water. And I think it just would have been cool to maybe see it end a little bit differently. This happens a lot with those types of movies also, the, the, the book movies where they have these really kind of set up endings and sometimes i don't mind it but this one kind of annoyed me it's it's like you're advertising the next movie before the first one's over and there's something about that that just kind of annoys me now that i always like to try to pick up on these tropes the scene where being ho gets back with Thomas after they take out the Griever, and they're trying to decide what to do with Thomas. And Minho says, I don't know if you're brave or stupid. Mm. That line, and to me, I feel like that is lazy writing. The other one that I just can't stand is when they come back, there's a scene where Chuck is sitting there, he's got everybody gathered up, and they're waiting for them to show up. And you just know what's going to happen in that scene. You're, you're, <laughs> you know they're going to sit there. It's going to lose hope, and then they appear. So there's always that scene where they sit there and they're waiting for it, and then they, they're all walking away except for that one guy that still has the hope. And then they come back, and then everybody notices, and that's all yeah. happy. And okay. that's just another trope that just happens in a lot of movies that I see all the time. The other one is the the take this before I die. Thing, which right. a lot also. <laughs> it's always death sentence. Yes. You know you're gonna die because you're the fat little kid. But which also brings okay. me to the point <laughs> that is also I very. I was wondering if that one was okay, gonna come up. There's also something very interesting about this movie. We can even go back to 
the Goonies, where that chubby kid character <laughs> is really just a comic relief yeah. character. Mm-hmm. And here's where I think they got a trope right, where they did not fall into the trap of the trope, where you put this chubby kid in there just to be a comic relief. He's actually of use in this movie, which is just goes along with everyone else in the movie has a use to him, and he is included. And Chuck definitely has, he has an honorable ending. He saves Thomas, and he dies. He he even saves the transmitter from falling off to the, to, off the edge so that they can get through the gate. So it's just, ha, seeing the chubby kid actually be of use and not just there for a comic relief was a fantastic part of that movie that I really enjoyed. I just hate seeing that all the time where he's like oh well here's the joke character and that just that character doesn't really show up in this movie yeah that's well that, yeah that's very true i mean the whole thing was you know pretty serious and and i think kept that tone because it needed to be but it, it didn't turn to kitty or you know it it just was uh pretty consistent there throughout all right joe so now that we've torn this movie apart here let's see how our actual scores go with this movie now our rating system is going to be a little different than what you normally see so i'm going to say that i really enjoyed this movie i thought the acting was solid the pacing was great and had a few surprises when it made it a really entertaining movie to see and i believe the rating for this movie should definitely be a go see it it's it's fun it's entertaining one that I enjoyed watching in the theaters. It has it has a scale about it that works great on the big screen, and I think it was done very well. I think, yeah, I think I would agree. I'd give it a go see it. Um, uh, you know, rent it, red box it, go see it. You know, I, I think it's definitely in that in that category. It's the pacing and and tone of it is you know right where it needs to be. I'm just not sure unless you really are a fan it's it's worth buying uh so i i wouldn't go that far i probably wouldn't get it on dvd on blu-ray you mean still a blu-ray dvd all right fine (laughs) (laughs) and that leads us to our next section here with the the previews which we're going to do nightcrawler yeah Audio bumper. Break. Break time. Break. Man, we really missed that one. October 17th. What day is it? We're all late (laughs) on going to see Nightcrawler. Which I think isn't an accident, by the way. (laughs) And we're we're back. (laughs) We went through a lot of previews when we went to go see uh, The Maze Runner, and... The one that we thought that was interesting that we'll probably review later is Nightcrawler, which is directed by Dan Gilroy. It's his directorial debut. He's one of the many writers for that failed movie Superman Lives. Even Kevin Smith was attached to that. Do you remember that? At some point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that failed Superman movie. Superman Lives. Yeah. He also wrote Two for the Money with, with Al Pacino, Matthew McConaughey, and Rene Russo, which I did not go. I have not movie. seen that no. movie. I have no idea what that is. And I don't even know Rene Russo still made movies, to be honest. I think we saw her in the Thor last. Oh, really? Yeah. Was she in Thor? Yes, yeah. Was she in Thor? She's the mother. She kind of has, like, that badass. Oh, gotcha. You know. I do remember Seen in the last and the second Thor. Oh wait, oh, wait a minute. I didn't see the second Thor movie. Oh, well, I guess we know what we're seeing next. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't seen the second Thor movie. I've got it here. So we might watch that and do a DVD review. But uh, actually, I think we know what's coming up next. Yeah, it stars Jake Gyllenhaal, this Nightcrawler movie. Jake Gyllenhaal is actually one of those actors who is a lot better than a lot of people give him credit for. I've seen him in, like, some really good stuff, and I've seen him in terrible, terrible I'm things. I'm just going to stop you right there. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I can't go and see a movie with any Jill and Hall in it. <laughs> so, not even Maggie? <laughs> no, not Maggie. 
I thought she was the worst part of the Dark Knight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, why'd they even bother with this character? I, mean, well, would you, I get it, but... You would know. you go see it for Bill Paxton? Because I like seeing Bill Paxton and stuff. <sighs> Come on! <laughs> it's Bill Paxton. It's Bill Paxton. He's always entertaining. I love. I just loved when he showed up in Edge of Tomorrow. <laughs> He's just like, right. bam! <laughs> <laughs> So, Edge of Tomorrow, a really good movie that not enough people went and saw. It is definitely way better than his, his uh, Tom Cruise's last sci-fi movie, Oblivion. wasn't bad, it just wasn't that great of a movie. It was very okay. I thought Edge of Tomorrow was Edge actually of, really good. Yeah, Edge of Tomorrow is really good, so DVD that. I'm just... I don't have a review or anything for Nightcrawler because I didn't go and see it. So we're previewing the trailer, oh, not right. the movie. Well, uh, so the what trailer, are your ideas from the, the trailer? The trailer isn't enough to get me to go and see it <laughs> because it's Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we shouldn't have picked this one then. I guess we're just done. Oh, so this okay. is the Half Past Podcast. Wait a minute. What if, what's up next? <laughs> what's up next? <laughs> Because I think we know what's on tap for May 1st. Well, obviously for May 1st, uh, we did this Maze Runner review very late. Most of the time we'll be doing these day of watching the movie. So our next one will definitely be Avengers Age of Ultron. The Age of Ultron! And... I can't wait to see that movie. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic. And I, I just I just can't wait. I can't I love seeing James Spader doing the voice. He just this everything about this movie I'm enjoying what I've seen. But that'll be next that'll be next time. So this is the Half Pass Podcast. I'm Graham Ricks. Jones. <laughs> see you next flick. <laughs>